33 minutes after the hour on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Thanks for being with us on this Wednesday. Hugh on vacation. I'm Guy Benson sitting in. David Drucker will be behind the microphone tomorrow and Friday. Well, you may have heard that the state of California is voting at the legislative level to pass single payer health care, government run health care. And there are a few complications, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, the biggest is. If this were to pass and be implemented, it would merely double the size of the state's budget, which is already out of control. They have a bad credit rating for a reason. They have massive structural deficits, and they're saying, let's double all of that with single-payer health care. And how are they planning to pay for it? We don't know, and they don't know. There is no plan. Vermont tried this as well, and it all collapsed because they couldn't pay for it, even in a small homogenous state they couldn't make it work without blowing a giant hole through their budget and yet the left tells us let's actually just impose this across the whole country look at europe they do it it should work here just fine uh i would direct them to the va to native american health care and some other big failures of single-payer health care here in america but joining me now to help break this whole issue down is dr scott atlas from the Hoover Institution out at Stanford University, whom I had the pleasure of meeting just a few weeks ago when I was a visiting fellow there. Uh, Dr. Atlas, it's great to talk to you again. Nice to be here. Thanks. All right. So let's. the reason that I wanted to bring this up is not just to poke some fun at California, because they deserve it, but I really believe that if you look at the direction of our debate in this country over health care, and if you look at polling of younger voters in places like... Well, not just the U.S., but the U.K. and their embrace of Jeremy Corbyn and the far left in Britain. I think sooner or later, we are going to have a full fledged debate over nationalized, socialized health care from coast to coast. That is the holy grail for Democrats. It's what they passed Obamacare to build toward. And I think there's a lot of misinformation floating around about the wonders of government run health care. And you've written extensively about this. So I want you to help conservatives in our audience learn some of the arguments against single payer health care, against government health care. And maybe some of the undecided people in our audience might think twice before jumping on board that bandwagon. So I'll sort of hand the floor over to you with this first question. Let's set aside the cost to taxpayers, because all of this costs a huge amount of money and there's much higher taxes in Europe on the middle class on the working class that would all have to come here as well but just from a doctor's perspective from a medical perspective we hear all the time that things are working great in Europe that America is at the bottom of the pack that our system is terrible and we would spend less with better results if the government ran everything what would you say what would your first point be in response well, the overall point would be that those arguments fly in the face of every historical fact looking at nations with single-payer health care systems. People have this kind of naive belief that it makes sense, but when you look at the actual data, which I and others have done, uh, you see the following. You see that the United States health care system, pre-Obamacare, compared to those countries with single-payer systems, we had the best survivals from cancer. We had the best survivals from other serious diseases, the best access to treatment, the best treatment outcomes for chronic diseases, the best access to screening tests, the best access to drugs, the best access to more modern diagnostic technology, the quickest access to life-changing important surgeries, the fastest access to specialists who are basically the entire gist of the way medical care is uh, provided these days, and our system is the source of the world's leading innovation by every single metric. The facts show that those single-payer systems not only are inferior for access to care, they are inferior for outcomes from treatment, and the reality is that when you look at those countries, their solution to their unconscionable waiting lists for care that we never experience here, their solution... Well, except at the VA. On, <laughs> in our experiments with single-payer. 
it's not funny, really. It's sad. But um, the, the reality is that the solution of those countries in Europe with single-payer systems, and they've had them for more than 50 years, is to pay, take taxpayer money, and pay for private care. And in, at times, even pay for private care with their taxpayer dollar in other countries across borders. Huh. It, is, it is really the, a, a, a complete I would. I don't know if I want to say why, but it's a complete distortion of fact to listen to the Bernie Sanders type argument that other countries have better health care. When you look at the facts, it's just completely 100 percent wrong. I'll call it a myth. How about that? And so if let's dig down a little bit, though, because I've heard the Bernie types and a lot of people who support the idea of single payer, they say it's fair it's equal, it costs less, and no, Dr. Atlas, you're wrong. I've read that American health or life expectancy rates are lower, that infant mortality rates are higher. Where are you coming up with your numbers? I've seen just the opposite. That would be the counterpoint. What would you say? Well, I would say that they really haven't looked at the, the studies closely. I'll give you one example. When you talk about life expectancy as a marker, an indicator of a health care system quality, you have to realize a couple things. Number one, there are dozens of factors that go into life expectancy that have absolutely nothing to do with health care quality. Genetics, population demographics, uh, type of medical care access, all kinds of things, societal norms on behavior, things like this. But let's look specifically at life expectancy. The OECD uh, is the organization of mainly economically developed countries in the world. We have near the bottom in life expectancy when you just look at the statistic. But when you look at that statistic, as researchers in Iowa did, and you standardize all countries for having the same amount of death from immediate gunshot wound to the head or suicide or high-speed motor vehicle accident with instant death. Okay, these are causes of death that have nothing to do with health care quality. I mean, I think right. everyone must admit that. Right, it's, it's, based on, it's based on you could make cultural arguments, you could say other things, but in terms of measuring the outcomes of a health care system, those people are dead instantly. So, no, so if you standardize... Go ahead. If you standardize, if you standardize the statistic in all the OECD countries of, for the same number of deaths from immediate death from gunshot wound to the head, suicide or car accident, the U.S. has the number one life expectancy, the highest life expectancy. That's just an illustration of the kind of contaminated statistic, the, the false argument about life expectancy reflecting health care quality. I mean, there are many other statistics that people here in the U.S. are simply uh, unaware of. And, and this is really the fault, I would say, of our Republican or conservative leaders who extol the virtues of our health care system, but they don't educate the public about the facts. If you look at the English system, the national health system in England, which has served as the model for Obamacare overtly and was discussed by, such, uh, by Democrats as such, even today, 18 percent, almost one out of five patients who need brain surgery wait more than four months after the diagnosis, after referral for brain surgery. Almost one out of five cancer patients in NHS in England referred for, quote, urgent treatment for already diagnosed cancer. One out of five patients don't get their first treatment for more than two months. This is unheard of in the United States and in fact would never be tolerated by Americans. These systems are, uh, frankly, a disgrace. The waiting lists are massive. There's 4 million people in England alone waiting for care. That's a record since they had their system over 65 years ago. And in fact, what's happening in these systems in Europe is that more and more people are buying private insurance, and frankly, anyone with any money or power in the UK uses the private system. So, I mean, those are a lot of striking statistics. One of the measures that I mentioned a moment ago was infant mortality rate. That's one that we have thrown 
at the U.S. system all the time, saying that our numbers are way worse than other industrialized countries or even non-industrialized countries. What's the reason for that? Well, that's a, that's another uh, kind of what I would call a very heterogeneous input statistic. When you look at the way the U.S. calculates infant mortality, it's very different from all the other countries. We count every single birth as a live birth. In other words, uh, no matter how small, no matter how unlikely the baby is to live, no matter how premature the infant is, in other countries, including those countries of Western Europe, they don't count, many of them don't even count babies as having been born in their calculation unless they survive 24 hours, unless they are a certain size, unless they are of certain gestational age, or in other words, maturity. And so they're, they're falsely uh, calculating the denominator of the fraction. They're, they're decreasing, they're, they're basically eliminating the babies that have the lowest chance of surviving. So right, which is how you can goose your statistics if you want to, and it's a credit to our system that we try to save as many of those babies as possible, but it counts against us in these statistics, which is why sometimes the stats are deeply misleading. My guest is Dr. Scott Atlas, who's a medical doctor, also a fellow at the Hoover Institution in California, Stanford University. Home stretch of today's Wednesday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. I'm Guy Benson of townhall.com and Fox News filling in for Hugh this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. David Drucker will be here Thursday and Friday. I also want to give one last additional plug. My book with Mary Catherine Ham, End of Discussion, we have a new edition coming out in August. It's August the 1st. Book initially came out two years ago. It's been updated. We have a new chapter, new material reflecting the Trump era. Endofdiscussion.com if you want to buy your advanced copy or your pre-order, whatever you want to call it. Endofdiscussion.com would really appreciate you doing that. My guest is Dr. Scott Atlas from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He's also a medical doctor. And we're talking about single-payer health care because I believe this debate is coming. California is a preview of that. It is wildly expensive. That's one side of the argument. And I think a lot of middle-class and working-class families would be astonished to learn how much their taxes would go up in order to pay for a government-run national health care system. But what Dr. Atlas has shown in quite a lot of scholarship is what you get for all that money is a far inferior system with long wait lists and worse outcomes, far less innovation, less responsiveness. Uh, It really is a lose-lose almost across the board, and yet it is fetishized on the left. Why do you think it is such a popular idea? Is it just the simplicity of it, doctor, that people seem to get it and say, okay, that seems fair, it makes sense, let's do it? Well, it's it's hard to guess at the at the motivation, but I think that it's it's a it's a it's a dream of people who believe that government is the answer to all problems, and perhaps this is the difference between conservatives and liberals, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I mean, I think that you have to understand, from my point of view and from the facts, uh, people know more about what they should do with themselves than uh, some other entity like the government. And when people are personally accountable for their own money and their own decisions, the outcomes are better. And, and we, we can see that in a variety of things, but we can see it in healthcare itself. I mean, that, that's the, the data. If you look at the data, it's not a philosophy that should guide policy. It's actually the facts. And so speaking of those facts, you ran through some of the numbers on wait times and waiting lists in places like Great Britain. Canada is really bad as well. Uh, They also outlaw certain drugs in places like Canada and NHS in Britain says we won't provide that drug. It's too expensive. Companies in those countries won't innovate because it's way too expensive and they're not going to make their money anyway. So we're the ones driving the, the engine of innovation in the medical field worldwide. That would change if we went to that sort of government run uh, system, one size fits all, but also I want to go back to one of your initial points, which was outcomes, actual health outcomes. We addressed um, life expectancy. We addressed infant mortality. What about cancer? What about heart disease? What about major uh, afflictions like that, our system versus those systems? 
Sure. I mean, first of all, the data, uh, the, the most uh, famous study of all was uh, published in uh, Verdecchia, was the author, in 2007, which, of course, is a very good time point to look at because it's before uh, the Obamacare discussion uh, and implementation began. The, the cancer survival rates in the United States versus all those countries in Western Europe was statistically significantly superior for all major cancers and for almost all rare cancers for men and for women. When you look at the most important chronic diseases like high blood pressure, uh, I mean, in uh, 2012, the New York Times came out as saying that because uh, less than 60 percent of people in the U.S., who had high blood pressure were actually receiving treatment. That was evidence of our dysfunctional system. They didn't bother to mention that every other country in in that study, England, Sweden, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, had far worse data on percent even receiving treatment. They didn't mention it? They didn't didn't mention it in the New York Times piece. Of course, that's part of the study, though. When you look at the, the relative percent of people who actually have things like high blood pressure or diabetes controlled, the U.S. has the highest success rate at controlling this. Uh, when you look at the access to screening tests, the screening tests are something that you would think a government-controlled system should be able to allocate. That's the whole point. I mean, that's a perfect uh, setup for that. Well, when you compare the U.S. to Canada, we have a higher access to screening tests for mammography, pap smears for cervix cancer, PSA for prostate cancer, colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy for colon cancer, we have better access even to screening tests than Canada, where the government controls it. And, and better it outcomes be- and better innovation and our taxes are lower. So, I mean, <laughs> throw this out uh, at your own peril, Americans. And I think conservatives need to be aware of these arguments sooner rather than later, which is why we were just speaking with Dr. Scott Atlas. Very quickly, you've written, written a book with a lot of this in there. What's the name of the book if people want to look it up? Well, one uh, book I wrote that has the details of all this data is called In Excellent Health, Setting the Record Straight on America's Healthcare. There you go. Dr. Scott Atlas, thank you for your time. Thanks to all of you for listening. To Dwayne, to Adam and the crew at the Hugh Hewitt Show, thanks to Hugh for letting me sit in. And to all of you for tuning in. Tomorrow and Friday will be David Drucker. And don't forget, Mary Catherine Hamm and my book, End of Discussion, new edition coming, endofdiscussion.com. Enjoy your Wednesday, everyone.